So yes, um, <clears throat> this talk is about how to assemble a uh, how to assemble data warehousing functionality in a Hadoop environment, and um, I'll start start out with a motivating example. This is a um, performance comparison of a commercial parallel database system running on columnar data against uh, Impala running on also columnar data, Parquet in this case. And this is a subset of the TPCDS workload running on a 15 terabyte scale factor data set on a 20 node cluster. And uh, showing the uh, latencies of the individual queries. And what you see is that you can uh, get out of the uh, Hadoop cluster running in Parler on Parquet, you already get better performance in at 19 out of the 21 queries than the commercial competitor. So this is a, like I said, one of the uh, top five commercial um, analytic database systems. And you can already get performance out of a Hadoop environment that exceeds uh, what you get here. So <clears throat> Hadoop has traditionally been used for batch processing, so focus on offline, um, a few big jobs, and so moving towards a typical analytic database functionality, you get workloads that look very different. Uh, on the one hand, you want interactive performance, so things that run very quickly, uh, maybe seconds, maybe even sub-second uh, response times, and then also you have a number of concurrent users, typically you don't have a single user using a large cluster on uh, his or her own. <coughs> So that is uh, something that has traditionally not been done or uh, possible with Hadoop, the Hadoop environment itself. So today I'll talk about basically a stack that it will enable you to do that. At the very bottom uh, you have HDFS as the storage system. Uh, there's, I'm going to be talking about Parquet as, the, um, as a storage columna, as a columna storage format and then about Impala as a parallel query engine running on top of HDFS. So um, I would like this to be interactive, so if you have questions, feel f uh, please feel free to ask and uh, don't wait until the very end. So what I'm trying to demonstrate is that <clears throat> in Hadoop, you're already getting a number of the techniques and the functionality that you, um, are, that you can expect from the commercial uh, enterprise data warehouse solutions. So, a number of these are already available and uh, those that aren't are often already being worked on. So uh, there is a rapid convergence um, <clears throat> of that platform uh, onto this kind of functionality. And at the same time, I'm also going to show that it still retains the uh, traditional Hadoop strength. So you still get the basically the scale out that you get with Hadoop and with that you basically get the flexibility and the cost effectiveness. Uh, starting out with HDFS, what is HDFS or what does it give you today? You already get the, um, <clears throat> the capability of doing high efficiency data scans. Data scans obviously are very important for analytic workloads and so this is obviously a cause of concern if that weren't the case. And then also uh, things that are on the roadmap are um, the ability to co-partition tables which is something that a number of parallel database systems do. If you have two large tables that are frequently joined on the same uh, expressions or columns, that you can co-partition them and physically co-locate the um, matching pieces so that you turn a distributed join into a uh, local join. And then also for um, iterative workloads, it would be which you see more and more coming up in the context of data science or machine learning. Uh, it is would be interesting to be able to generate um, intermediate result data that stays entirely in memory and never hits disk. So if you want to iterate quickly, that is a benefit and so this is uh, similar to sort of temp fs functionality. Okay. Yes? Uh, for co-parting tables, do we need to manually place the files in the, uh, in the manner which you said? No, so you wouldn't. Have the HFS, uh, name will take care of that. Right, the name node will take care of it in a way. Um, I'll get into the details in a second. So, uh, talking about data transfers, so HDFS has supported a feature called short circuit reads for a while now. I think it went in uh, sometime last year, and uh, or maybe two years ago. So basically, that means if you're doing local reads, you are um, bypassing the data node protocol entirely and are doing and are talking directly to the operating system. So that way, you can get um, basically full disk bandwidth. 
we routinely measure in excess of 500 megabytes a second per disk. So that is, in essence, the hardware speed, and uh, so that's a very um, good thing to have. There's also a newer feature um, for high memory configurations called HDFS caching. So what you would do here is you would explicitly cache either a table or a, um, or a partition of a table. In HDFS, you would cache a directory or a particular file. And what that means is you basically tell the name node that um, this thing is cached and it will instruct one of the data nodes that has a copy to place it in memory. So the name node will know where the um, copy is placed in memory, so you can then run your queries against that uh, block replica. And when you do the local read, instead of going through the regular um, protocol, which does checksumming and does a uh, copy into your address space, you, in essence, you mlock the data, and which uh, locks it in the buffer cache and then you map it into your address space. So that way you get basically uh, completely zero cost access to the data. And uh, similar to how um, relational database systems manage their own buffer caches. And uh, we've measured performance improvements on the order of uh, factor of three for data that already sits in memory. So compared to data that sits in memory but is transferred through the OS buffer cache, you can still get a factor of three or four speed up. So fairly substantial and um, obviously good if you have a lot of memory and want to do in-memory processing in essence. Things that are not in HDFS yet, one is a feature called affinity groups. So affinity groups basically gives you the ability to co-locate blocks from different files on the same machine. So it's a physical structuring mechanism and that would be the basis of uh, co-partitioning tables because those Obviously, the blocks of those tables would belong to different files, but you still need to make sure they end up on the same machine. Another use case is also a, um, a, a variant of storing parquet columnar files. So you can also use this uh, by, uh, in order to basically shred the data into multiple files, but make sure that uh, a row, the data that belongs to a single row still stays on the same machine. And then I already mentioned basically tempfs functionality. So um, that's something that's being talked about also as uh, a means of speeding up workloads that run basically against in-memory data. That was the HDFS overview. If there are any more questions, feel free to ask. Um, <clears throat> Parquet is a columnar format that was, that's a co-development between Cloudera and Twitter. So. Um, we started working on that, I think, something like two years ago, and then found out through mutual friends that Twitter was also working on that. And so and eventually, we ended up deciding to join forces. And this is uh, what came out of it. Um, the goal here was to develop a columnar format that is competitive with the state-of-the-art commercial formats. So all recent analytic databases, or basically all commercial <coughs> analytic databases, uh, rely on columnar storage. And uh, the columnar storage that was available in HDFS at the time, which was RC file, was very much lacking in terms of both compression efficiency and scan efficiency. So we set out to basically fix that and decide and develop something that gives you, um, gives you high scan and compression efficiency. Um, Parquet is uh, open source and actually is an Apache incubator project now and has had uh, contributions from companies such as Criteo, which is uh, there in Paris. They wrote the Hive 30, for instance. There's also a company called Stripe. They do payments processing. They've uh, contributed something. Berkeley Amp Lab did some things. Uh, I know that LinkedIn is actually moving towards Parquet storage internally. So they want to move that data into Parquet. And uh, I also have Netflix is very interested, for instance. And it's already in production at Twitter and Criteria. Um, <clears throat> so Parquet is a columnar format that was specifically designed to be able to uh, run against and store efficiently nested data. So if you're using serialization formats such as Avro or uh, Thrift or protocol buffers or JSON, for instance, uh, those were the, basically the target data sets 
And what we ended up doing is basically adopting the, um, the representation of the nesting structure that was pioneered in Dremel's column I.O. So Dremel, the Dremel guys came up with a particularly efficient way of encoding that that still maintains the columnar properties. So meaning especially that um, if you are scanning a single column that is several nesting levels down in your structure, you still will only need to access uh, that column's data on disk. There are some other formats such as org file that require you to read data from the parent uh, columns. So with org file you wouldn't get the columnar property and you would have to access more data than just from that particular column. Um, Parquet has an extensible set of column encodings, so the current version supports uh, run length and dictionary encoding, which is very effective for basically for compression purposes and is also fast to decompress. And uh, there's already a specification for version 2.0 out, which will also have, um, which will also store um, statistics. So you can, it's internally organized into pages and it will store statistics such as min and max for a particular page and will then allow you to skip through the data very quickly. And there will also be uh, delta encodings, for instance, and uh, sorted dictionaries. So you can end up, if you have string dictionaries that are sorted and delta encoded, <clears throat> you can again get even better compression ratios and uh, without any, taking any hit in terms of the decompression speed. This is a, can you read this? Probably not. Um, this is a graph that shows the storage efficiency of a number of file formats that are popular in the Hadoop environment. So what we did was we took the uh, TPCH line item table at a one terabyte scale factor and on the very left hand side you see uh, the original representation in raw text occupies about 750 gigabytes and then to the right of that are the different formats. You see LZO text <coughs> with LZO compression for instance. Then you know the third from the right is RC file with snappy compression. And then the two on the very right hand side are Parquet with Snappy and Sequence File with Gzip. So you see that you get, um, with Parquet because it uses dictionary encoding, etc., you're getting a uh, compression efficiency that is already on par with uh, Gzip over the raw text data in essence. So Gzip is often used for its uh, high compression uh, effectiveness. The downside of Gzip, and it's a very severe downside, is that it is extremely runtime intensive on the decode end. And uh, we would not, I would not recommend using it at all unless you have archival data. So if you never really want to read the data, you should use gzip, otherwise you shouldn't. And for instance, Snappy is a much better, much faster um, compression codec on the decompression side. <clears throat> this is a comparison of the scan efficiency. Oh. Do the parquet uh, columnar structure is part and partition? Because GZIP cannot be partitioned. Right. Well, sequence file is a splittable format. And so that's why this is, on the very right hand side, it shows sequence file with GZIP. Uh, Parquet is not a splittable format. What you, the way it's normally written is that you write it in very large blocks. So one block equals one file, and a typical block size is something like 500 meg or one gigabyte. And then you basically have one piece sitting in HDFS and uh, that guarantees that all of the um, different columnar chunks that are in there are kept together so you don't have to access multiple machines when you read it back. Uh, so this is a comparison of the scan efficiency. So what we did here was we ran a, a subset of the TPCDS workload against um, different file formats and the blue bar is text, again raw text, uh, the red bar is sequence file with snappy. Then you see the orange bar, which is RC file with snappy. And that is an interesting comparison because RC file is also a columnar format. And the green bar is parquet with snappy. And as you can see, in most cases, you get a, um, well, in all cases, you get a speed up. And in some cases, you get a very dramatic speed up, especially compared to RC file. So uh, parquet is a very efficient file format, both for, in terms of compression and scan efficiency. This concludes the uh, Parquet overview, and uh, so I'll move on to Impala. Uh, so Impala was 
designed to be a um, basically parallel query engine, but specifically for the Hadoop environment. So that means that um, it is not the same as a parallel database system because it's only the query engine component. So it relies on Hadoop to basically give it the other pieces that, you, that are needed in order to assemble the database functionality. So that means it runs against HDFS and HBase as the storage managers, and um, it utilizes Metastore to uh, store metadata, and then in the latest version, 1.3, available on CDH5, there's also an integration with Yarn, so with a cluster resource manager, which allows you to run MapReduce and Impala side by side and do relatively flexible resource sharing. Um, Impala was written from the ground up, so it wasn't based on some open source um, uh, single node query engine such as Postgres. And uh, based on our benchmarks, uh, we can confidently say that it's the highest performance SQL engine that you can get for Hadoop at this point. And as I've shown in the beginning, you can already outperform commercial, uh, some commercial systems. <clears throat> Impala was designed to be easy to integrate into traditional um, enterprise data warehouse environments. So that specifically means you want to connect to it with business intelligence tools. So that means you want to have ODBC and JDBC in terms of the connectivity. You want uh, Kerberos and LDAP for uh, authentication and you want role-based SQL style authorization. So the ability to define roles and then grant and revoke privileges um, are things that are available through uh, in Impala. Impala was a development started about three years ago and the first beta version came out in October of 2012. The current version is actually not 1.2.3, it is 1.3 that is available for uh, CDH5 and soon we'll have a 1.31 out that will be available for CDH4 and CDH5. Oh, and it is actually open source and hosted on GitHub. So, and we're actually developing against the external repo. So uh, what's basically out there in, as the current version is already visible in the repo. So from a user's perspective, um, Impala basically gives you a view of your physical data in HDFS or HBase through a uh, basically a relational lens. You define a table as a virtual view over that data and uh, you define your logical layout, you know, the um, columns and the data types of the columns and then you basically uh, also declare how your physical data maps into it. In particular, you basically list in a lot of cases simply the um, base directory and uh, by convention all files underneath that directory are uh, seen as being part of that table. Uh, that metadata is stored in Metastore so that you can actually use the same tables or view the same tables and query the same tables through Hive and Pig and anything that accesses uh, data through H catalog. I already mentioned uh, ODBC and JDBC and the authentication protocols. Um, in terms of SQL, Impala basically gives you SQL and C SQL 92, uh, limited to uh, basically select and bulk inserts, at least against HDFS. So in HDFS, it's not really possible to do uh, update and delete very effectively because the data, in essence, is write only. Right? You cannot really go into the middle of the file and then overwrite something very easily. So. Uh, Hence, the, uh, the limitations basically dictated by the storage manager. Impala does not have subqueries right now, but it already supports UDFs and UDAs. So you can get some user-defined logic into, uh, into your queries. UDFs are supported in Java and C++, and UDAs are, need to be written in C++. Um, we are also working on support for Python uh, user logic. So Python UDFs, UDAs, and also UDTFs. Um, I actually want to do a... What was that? Oh, UDA, user-defined aggregate function. So, you know, the equivalent of sum, except whatever you want to do with it. So, um, one question here for the audience. Who uses Python in any way, shape, or form? Two. Okay. A few. All right. So, are you doing... Are you doing basically data science type workloads, machine learning, or what is that? Yes. Yeah. 
So uh, yeah, so our goal is to basically also have all of the uh, UDF CDAs and UDTFs uh, available for Python. And uh, we're actually working on something right now that allows you to compile Python into <coughs> native code. So we've run some experiments where you basically have Python, a Python UDF that is, ends up being compiled into native code and incorporated into Impala's runtime code generation framework. And you get some very dramatic speed ups to interpret it Python. Kind of nice. Um, here's what's coming. Uh, 1.3 just came out. And as part of 1.3, you also now get admission control. So if you run a multi-user, a concurrent workload, you want to be able to um, make sure that not all users run at the same time, so you want to make sure that you, the system only runs as many queries as it can support, and so you can, just, you can set up pools and define for each pool a limit on the number of concurrent queries and also a limit on the total amount of memory that is being uh, utilized, and it basically then does throttling based on that. The uh, next version, 1.4, will also include the decimal data type. So that is, if you are a financial institution, you definitely want fixed point arithmetic. So this is a standard SQL data type and isn't supported yet at this point, but it'll um, come soon. And then uh, the next big version, 2.0, will also contain analytic window functions. So basically the, the, um, the partition by, order by clauses, um, you, can, you can have an order by without a limit. Right now it requires a limit. Um, there will also be support for nested types. So you will be able to query basically uh, nested data structures such as represented in JSON or XML or Parquet um, with uh, native SQL extensions that uh, make it look and feel more like traditional SQL. There will also be user-defined table generating functions. So typically if you have custom logic that you cannot express as simply being run on a single value or as a single aggregate, you need these user-defined table generating functions. So if, you, if you're computing anything like uh, models, such as in a machine learning process, that's probably something that you want. And then there will also be disk-based joins and aggregation. Right now Impala does um, purely memory-based joins and aggregation, and um, so we'll also be working toward uh, removing that. One question, um, will it possible to use uh, maps on uh, 2.0 to um, map this or to dynamic age-based columns? Because it's now not possible in Impala. Possibly. Um, we're not, yeah, it's possible. You could do it that way. Um, we haven't, our age-based support hasn't, uh, um, isn't very extensive yet. So there are a number of things you might want to do with age-based that Impala doesn't support yet. And uh, the problem with HBase is that it's not very good for analytic applications because the throughput you get is so low. You typically only get a few percentage points of what the hardware can do. So uh, if you have a scan-based, or if you have a heavy analytic workload with lots of scans, you typically don't want to use HBase. So we've, it's, it's lagged a little bit. Um, <clears throat> Moving on to the architecture, so Impala, as I mentioned before, is basically a parallel database system, a parallel query engine, and as such, it has a daemon process running on every node that, cont that contains any relevant data. So you would basically have it co-located with every data node in every uh, HBase region server in your cluster. And uh, each of these daemons can handle user requests. So when a user request comes in, that daemon to which it was submitted then takes it and turns it into a sequence of planned fragments. The planned fragments in turn are handed over to a coordinator that then initiates execution on all of the nodes that contain relevant data. So Impala knows uh, of each file that you're querying, uh, what blocks it is composed of, and where the blocks replicas live, and even the disk IDs of the block replicas. Prefer one special load balancer or the internal logic for load balancing multi user requests at the same time? Um, Is there any recommendation? Should I, oh, should I repeat the questions for the recordings? Probably okay. So the question was um, do we recommend using a specific daemon or what, how, do you, uh, how do you load balance across the cluster? And the answer is we typically recommend using it with a load balancer such as HA proxy which would then round-robin across your uh, demons. Uh, 
the coordinator doesn't usually do a lot of heavy lifting, so it's not uh, the end of the world if you run against, let's say, one or a few. But if you have a uh, high throughput workload, you probably want to use a load balancer for that type of thing. And it's a big lift of the performance when you balance? Would you use a reference? Yeah. Not, so the question was, is there a big gain in terms of performance if you use load balancing? That depends entirely on your workload. If you have a highly concurrent, if you have lots of concurrent clients, then uh, there might be quite a bit of gain, yeah. We have some customers that are interested in running several hundred, hundred uh, concurrent clients, for instance. So here's an example, here's a diagram of how this works. So in this diagram, you have a um, three-node cluster. And each of these, you probably can't read that, but uh, each of these at the very bottom, you see the, the blue things are the HDFS data node and the HBase region server processes. And the, um, the orange boxes are uh, the uh, single Impala daemon, which internally is multi-threaded and can basically, each thread can, uh, can run any of the, uh, perform any of the functions that are internally uh, requested. So here you have a query showing up and being handed off to the planner, which then does the planning and produces a collection of planned fragments. Those planned fragments are then passed on to the query coordinator, which then initiates execution. So it talks to all of the Impala demons that have any relevant data based on the, um, the metadata that is cached so uh, Impala gets its metadata from the Hive Metastore, but also from the HDFS name node about the, you know, what, what blocks are in a file, <coughs> where do the block replicas live, and even from the HDFS data nodes, um, so it finds out on which disks individual blocks are stored. While the query is running, you have the query executors, which are doing the actual execution. They are reading data off disk or from HDFS and from HBase and performing local um, scans and aggregations and joins. And the results of those are then streamed back uh, to uh, either other executors or the query coordinator and then streamed back to the client as well. Um, <clears throat> starting at the top, so the planning process is very similar to what you would see or expect from a uh, traditional parallel database system, you basically were doing a two-phase planning process. Uh, the first phase produces a single node plan that is basically a tree of query operators. So query operators such as scans and joins, aggregation, and uh, or top n or sort. And then in a second phase, you doing you partition the plan into fragments, and each fragment is executed on, on a um, on a particular machine. And the goal of this partitioning process is to um, uh, retain scan locality. So all scans are done locally because the throughput of local scans is much, much higher than doing remote scans. So if you're doing remote reads across HDFS, you're typically getting on the order of 30 megabytes a second. Like I said, when you're doing local reads, you're often exceeding 100 megabytes a second. And <clears throat> Impala then also tries to um, put as much processing as possible into a single plan fragment. So you're basically doing the maximum amount of local processing and local pre-aggregation in order to minimize the amount of data that then has to be streamed between nodes. <coughs> as part of that parallelization process, Impala also manages to parallelize all query operators. So all joins are run in parallel across all um, nodes that are participating in the query. And uh, the same is true for aggregation and uh, top end aggregation as well. Um, <clears throat> Impala has several steps that are cost-based. So Impala uses the table statistics that you can compute uh, through a compute stats command. So you would basically run that, <coughs> Impala would do a full table scan and then uh, gather stats on the table, such as the number of rows and the, um, some statistics about the columns such as the, the sizes of string columns, the average sizes of string columns, or the number of distinct values in individual columns. So, and it uses that uh, during the optimization process to determine the correct join order, and then also the join distribution. So it chooses between, um, it chooses between broadcast distribution and par uh, partition distribution. So if you're joining a very large table against a small table, it is often advantageous to broadcast the small table out to all of the nodes that have any data for the big table. If you are joining two large tables, 
that is often not, not a good idea, and instead you would repartition both of those uh, jo uh, uh, join inputs. Um, as I mentioned before, Impala was written from the ground up, and one of the explicit goals of that was uh, to get uh, high efficiency. So it is written uh, in C++ and uh, doesn't do any map reduce at all. Uh, all. All communication is directly process to process, and Impala relies to a large extent on in-memory algorithms and execution. So in particular, that means that um, the results of aggregation and the um, joins are executed as hash joins, meaning you build a hash table in memory, and uh, which means you need to have enough memory in order to hold the input. Now, for a lot of, in a lot of cases, that is actually uh, not a very large requirement. For instance, if you want to join against a one terabyte table, you are not materializing the whole table in memory, you are only materializing the subset of the table that you need to access in order to execute the query, which can be substantially less than the table itself. So in this example that I put together, you're basically going down to uh, just 0.1% of the whole data that's being utilized for the query itself. Um, that, in combination with partition joins, means that you uh, materialize that data in the aggregate memory of, uh, of the entire cluster. So, and a lot of clusters today have very large amounts of memory available, so you can effectively uh, run against very large tables. Uh, one thing that Impala does that is fairly novel is uh, it uses runtime code generation with a tool called LLVM. LLVM is a, um, basically a, a compiler toolkit that allows you to uh, create code snippets at runtime and then compile them into native code and also use optimization, etc. So unlike, um, I would say, older forms of runtime code generation that relied on basically generating C++ and then you use GCC or something like this in order to compile that, which can take a very long time, Using LLVM for basically compiling the big loops that make up the bulk of your query is actually very fast. So typically, we only spend on the order of less than 200 milliseconds on the compilation part. So it's very fast, but has the advantage of basically generating, um, generating instructions that are as efficient as if you had written the query by hand in C++. So in particular, you get rid of all dead branches, or unnecessary branches, so there's no interpretive overhead. Um, you can propagate constants, and in particular, you can inline all function calls. So if you're doing expression evaluation, typically in a lot of systems that is done uh, through an interpretive mechanism. So if you're, if you're comparing a column against you know, uh, the value of two other columns added, A plus B, you would often do a number of function calls in order sim to um, evaluate the simple expression. With Impala, that is actually compiled into the addition uh, instruction and then a comparison. <coughs> so here's an example of uh, what that can buy you in terms of runtime efficiency. Here is, I'm sure you can't read this, I can barely read it. It's basically uh, four queries starting on the very left with a simple count star from one table and then um, doing a slightly more complicated count of a particular column, and then on the right-hand side you see one of the TPCH queries, which does a single table aggregation, but computes a number of aggregates and with more complicated expressions, including arithmetic expressions. And this was run on, I'm not sure what data format this was, but this was run on a 10-node cluster. And the blue bar is the runtime without code generation, and the orange bar is with code generation, and you can see that, and this is against in memory execution, but you can see that uh, runtime code generation buys you um, <clears throat> anything from you know, a factor of four to, in this case, a factor of 16 speed up. So fairly dramatic. And again, all because you're getting rid of, uh, for the most part, you're getting rid of uh, function calls and things like that. This concludes the architectural overview, and I was going to move on to a uh, number of performance comparisons. Now, if there are any more questions, feel free to ask. Um, one thing we did, this was uh, maybe a few months back, was a comparison of Impala against a MapReduce-based um, query execution framework, in this case Hive 12, the most recent release of Hive, that is also known as Stinger, phases one and two. 
So this does not include TES yet, because TES is actually not out in uh, GA, but uh, we'll be doing that soon as well. So this is the uh, high version 12, and both running on a uh, columnar data parquet in the Impala case and org file in the Hive case <coughs> on a three terabyte scale factor TPC DS data set on a five node cluster. And what we did is we ran a subset of the data, uh, of the workload, and we bucketed the queries according to how much data they access, how much fact table data they access. <coughs> and we labeled the ones that only access a few months of data interactive, and then the ones that access, do a full table scan and access the entire data set, uh, deep analytics, and then there was a report thing in the middle. And what you're seeing here is the um, geometric mean of the response time of each query in that bucket. And you can see the blue bars and Paula that you can get um, basically interactive performance with uh, the MapReduce-based setup, Hive 12, you're getting something that is very far from that. So, uh, you know, something on the order of two or three minutes per query, which doesn't really work in interactive environments. We also did a comparison against a number of other, um, a number of other um, parallel uh, SQL engines that are not MapReduce based. Actually, I take that back. Shark is still running Hive, but running against Spark. So Spark is an in-memory uh, processing system, runtime system, and Shark is basically an adaptation of Hive against uh, Spark, the Spark runtime. There's also a thing called Presto, which is a development from Facebook, <coughs> and then we measure it against Impala 1, 2, 3. Um, these systems, for the most part, don't support Parquet, so we did most of our measurements in RC file, and then, but then also have some Parquet measurements just to see the difference. And this is, a, uh, again, a subset of the TPCDS data set uh, workload running on a 15 terabyte scale factor data set on a 21 node cluster. This cluster was large enough, has enough memory, so that all of this uh, runs out of memory. And what you're seeing here is the same, the performance graphs for the same buckets uh, starting on the left, you have Shark in two modes. One runs directly against, HDF against HDFS, another one runs against RDDs. So our Spark has this feature called um, Resilient Distributed Data Set that basically caches data in memory. And it seems to come with some um, runtime overhead. In the middle, the green thing is Presto, and on the right-hand side, the, um, the blue bars are at Pala on RC file and Parquet. Here's another view of this, but now a, um, a multi-user benchmark. So this is more, more interesting actually for typical data warehousing environments where you're not just, just running a single user, you're actually running multiple users that are accessing the system and running queries. And what you see here is for each bar, um, each of these is one of the systems. And um, the bar on the left is the one showing the single user uh, um, latency. And the bar on the right shows the latency at running 10 users concurrently. So you see in a lot of these cases, the latency goes up dramatically with the uh, number of concurrent users. Impala is on the, the two on the right hand side going uh, for RC file and then on the very right hand side is Parquet. And you see that um, the amount of um, <coughs> increase in latency is relatively moderate. And the reason here is that Impala does not currently parallelize uh, or run, run it, runs uh, aggregation and joins single threaded, so you don't get full utilization of your cluster with a single query, which means that if you run a uh, multi-user benchmark or workload, you get more um, overall utilization without necessarily impacting latency. Here's another view of this, uh, the throughput on the left-hand side, but the interesting thing is the uh, total CPU hours consumed by running that entire workload. And as you can see, these Impala manages to stay uh, very lean and only use, in the Parquet case, actually 81 um, CPU hours in total for that entire workload, whereas systems such as uh, Presto, or in particular Shark, it goes up to 4,200 uh, CPU hours for the entire workload. So the that just as a demonstration that this uh, focus on efficiency, and in particular the runtime co-generation, actually pays off in real-world scenarios. Uh, one other performance 
study we did was basically measuring the scalability of Impala, and in particular, along the dimensions that you care about in a typical data warehouse environment. So what you normally want to do is you want to be able to address response time. And so in a Hadoop environment, the, the goal and the promise is that you get linear scalability uh, basically by scale out, right? You can, you can address any bottleneck by simply adding nodes to your system. And so the question was to what extent is that actually true? And so the dimensions are response time, then of course concurrency, meaning query throughput, you want to add more users to your cluster. Can you do that by simply adding nodes to the cluster? And then of course the data set size, can you effectively deal with growing data sets by adding nodes to the cluster? And what we did was a comparison against on two nodes, uh, sorry, two clusters that, com, uh, that are comprised of identical hardware, but simply one is uh, twice the amount as the other one. And um, the baseline is running against a 15 terabyte scale factor data set, and we're focused on the interactive queries from the TPCDS workload. <coughs> and here's a simple uh, response time scaling. You basically just give it twice the hardware, what happens to response time, and you can see the blue bars indicate the um, larger cluster, and response time roughly goes down by 50%, which is very desirable. This is the, um, the multi-user scaling. Here you double your cluster size, and you also double the number of concurrent users, and you can see that response time stays roughly the same. And here the same along the data size dimension. So here now you go from a 15 terabyte to a 30 terabyte scale factor, data sets and uh, again doubling your cluster gives you still roughly the same response time. So this basically concludes the talk. So the goal here was to demonstrate that you can already use a, an all open source, all Hadoop stack in order to basically run uh, business intelligence slash data warehousing workloads. And uh, that is not just effective for that, but also retains the traditional Hadoop strengths. So in particular, you still get the Hadoop scale out, and the, uh, which is, gives you a lot of flexibility. And then, of course, cost effectiveness, right? This is not a multi-million dollar system that you have to assemble this way. Um, <clears throat> here, just a recap. So uh, like I mentioned before, HDFS already gives you a number of features that, are, that you expect from high-end uh, commercial systems. And Parquet already is a file format that is uh, competitive, also with high-end commercial systems. Yeah. This concludes the talk. And uh, uh, questions? Uh, well, you can insert through Impala. You can't really. You can't run an update statement. Yes, but you can run a select statement and then it generates good statements and it updates. So actually, you can uh, execute updates with Impala. There you go. I have a question about the Impala Uh, so the specific question was, or a statement was that SAS um, has some integration with Impala, and you were saying that that works better than Impala on its own? Yes. yes. Um, well, I, I would think that if you want SAS functionality, then not having SAS is a, a, you know, wouldn't be very useful for you. So Impala on its own without SAS, if you want SAS, uh, I can see why SAS would claim that. see technically how it can be, how it can possibly be. Better oh, better performance. I'm not sure about that. I don't know the details of that. My guess is, and I'm, this is a pure conjecture, that there is some sort of caching going on in SAS. So it's possible that 
if you don't have enough memory on your uh, HDFS cluster and your Hadoop cluster, that there's more caching on the SAS side and that might give you some speed up. The second question would be about also about um, Spark. Um, and also the cloud error is threatening Spark in some, in some um, directions also. Um, I was not hoping for the direction. Uh, I would be also interested to see uh, what would be the difference between the current Spark physical implementation, which is another version of Sharp, what I understood. And the impact. What would be? Uh, why would be better impact as, as, as performance in, in this regard? Oh, so the question was, um, how is Impala different than Spark SQL? Is that what you're talking yes, about? Yes, because on this year, previously we were using Sharp. That was the, the SQL part of the Spark. Now right. today, we need another uh, right. version. Yeah, um, I'm not. I'm not that familiar with Spark SQL, so I can't tell you if there are still functional limitations or if it supports the entire uh, gamut of SQL that is supported by Impala right now. I don't know about that. Number one, I, we haven't measured the performance, so I cannot speak to that. Um, however, as you saw, Shark is not uh, performance competitive at all. Uh, there will be significant, but what, what is the implementation difference? What, what is Perhaps in, as implementation wise better. Because also Spark is doing some sort of key memory things, putting some sort of EO out of the box. So this is what, what I was in it, always trying to, to better outperform. And also I have the screen with also impact by some of the same. Reducing the input output and uh, putting more into the memory and the memory computation. So the question was um Again, about uh, what does Spark do differently, and how you know how do Spark and Impala maybe converge on some things? So definitely uh, talking about in-memory processing, Impala doesn't do any caching; it relies on HDFS instead. So I talked about HDFS caching and how it allows you to uh, basically pin things, <coughs> parts of the data set in memory, and then get very fast access to it, basically uh, without any additional copies. So that is just as efficient as if you were to access it from your, the caching process. So in the Spark case, they uh, cache it in the process and then simply get a pointer to the data, in essence. So you get the same kind of efficiency and the same kind of functionality with, from Impala plus HDFS. But it's not in Impala, it's simply in HDFS. And uh, I would say it's a, um, there's an, advent, an advantage to having it in HDFS because that means that the data and the cache data in particular is available to anything that you run in your Hadoop cluster. In Spark, it is only available to Spark and Shark. Um, so there's a limitation there. And uh, so I think uh, it's, it's more, um, it makes the data more widely accessible. And there's also we're actually working with the Databricks guys to, uh, for them to move into the direction that if you're running Spark on HDFS, they utilize caching. And they also want to materialize the data in Parquet. So once you have that, you would basically have that data accessible through both through Spark and Impala and whatever else you want. To elaborate a little bit on memory usage, so let's assume we would have an HDFS uh, running maybe 30 gigs uh, of RAM, and then there might be some direct memory allocation via the fast circuit reads, and then there might be uh, in the process on top, how much memory would you give it? Um, and then if you join, let's say, two five terabyte tables, what kind of, what kind of scale, I mean, how do, you, uh, how do we uh, imagine building up a cluster that could issue a join between those tables? Okay. So the question was uh, basically about recommendations for cluster sizing, and in particular, how much memory you should allocate, and how does Impala use memory? So uh, Impala uses memory both during scans for caching or for basically buffering. Uh, Impala does multi-threaded scans and so you basically want to keep the threads busy and so you need a certain amount of buffering in order to do that. So uh, there's that, then there's also, it builds up hash tables for the joins and aggregation. The, um, when you're doing short circuit reads, that on its own does not require any memory. So, and then there's of course HDFS caching. If you configure that explicitly, you can basically, uh, you know, you need to determine in advance what part of your data set should be cached. Um, I mean, it's a Java process of probably 30 gigabytes to the largest you should go. 
uh, what's the Java process? The issuance process. Well, <coughs> but that's, that's separate from, uh, so the question was, uh, since HDFS is a Java process, should you give it no more than 30 gigabytes? And the answer is, HDFS caching is separate from that. It is not, it is not stored on the Java heap. Um, like I said, it is M-locked. So you're using system calls to uh, lock the thing in memory. And uh, you can use as much as you have available if you want. Um, we, again, this, how much you'd want to dedicate to that depends on analysis of your workload. You should determine in advance which uh, data gets accessed frequently enough to warrant caching. Um, however, I would recommend, so you talked about initially about 30 gigabytes, let's say per node. 30 gigabytes is actually fairly small these days. And the reason is that um, there is, if you're trading off disk access time or access time versus access frequency, there's actually a, uh, you need to access data very infrequently in order for it to be economically feasible to leave it on disk. The problem with disk is that uh, IOs are very expensive. Disks can only do on the order of you know, 100, maybe 200 IOs per second. And flash is very different. But regular um, spinning, um, you know, spinning platter disks give you very few IOs per second. So in order to sustain a high throughput, you need very many of them. That makes it very expensive. Uh, main memory gives you um, a, very fast access, and B, it gives you very high throughput. So main memory buses give you on the order of 30 gigabytes a second, right? You would need to basically put 200 enterprise drives in a single server in order to match that. So in a lot of cases, memory turns out to be the cheapest storage technology for a lot of problems. In particular, right, if you want performance, uh, getting that out of a disk-based system is, is very expensive. So, Can I uh, get involved into trouble? Usage, or is it aware of uh, how much you can use and it just gets slower? You can, well, so you can configure Impala with a process wide memory limit. You can give, give each query a memory limit, a per node memory limit. And now with admission control, you can also set cluster wide global limits on pools. And then you, Impala will not run more queries concurrently uh, that would exceed that amount of uh, memory. However, it will not run fast as more slowly, it will simply reject queries. So if you give it a memory limit, if the in-memory hash table is, exceeds the limit, it basically aborts the query. So regarding heap rate, uh, you So the question was specifically about uh, solid state drives. Do we, um, do we use SSD based clusters internally to uh, do performance benchmarks? And the answer is no, not yet. But it's definitely an area that we want to move into as well. There's a lot of interest in that. And so there could still be some improvements. Uh, there are probably some improvements that we still have to make in order for you to get full hardware bandwidth. Uh, we haven't done that yet. We haven't actually scaled it out very far yet. We have some customers that are running multi-hundred node clusters, but uh, we're sort of working internally on a setup that can replicate that. So I can't produce any um, hard numbers yet. I can't, I mean, uh, unless I, like I said, unless I measure it, I can't really, you know, I guess it's kind of, uh, ideally it would just go, you know, continue on. <laughs> Yeah, but 
So the question is, um, Hadoop is usually run on commodity hardware. However, um, the recommendation for Impala is to, to run it with at least 128 gig per node. Can Impala only be run on very high memory configurations? And the answer is no, not at all. But there is some uh, limit on the amount of concurrent query workload that you can then run, simply because of the requirement of fitting intermediate results into memory. So, uh, but there's no, like I said, there's no requirement. Also, uh, but I want to point that out again, that, uh, so first of all, 128 gig is actually not that, um, not that high nowadays. And memory is simply, uh, it's not that expensive anymore. So you still, you see routine configurations now on the order of, uh, I say, 128 gig. We have some customers that definitely go in with higher configurations. And you can still get pretty much the commodity um, <coughs> server DRAM prices, I would say, easily up to 256 gig. So at some point, when you get, when you get very high per node configurations, the price per gigabyte goes up. But I think uh, easily until 256 gig, you're still paying the same price as you would for, let's say, 64 per gigabyte, obviously, right? So, um, and again, uh, memory is the cheapest storage technology if you care about transfer bandwidth. And then one more question. Did you compare your solution with such solution as SATA and Hadoop? Or is it because you have a better memory and you want to be efficient? Okay. So the question was, how do you compare this to SAP HANA? And the answer is, um, Impala is just a query engine, whereas HANA is specifically also contains a storage manager that is a memory-based storage manager, but a storage manager nonetheless, and that allows you to do um, single record updates. So you can basically do online updates. And Impala on its own doesn't do that. It would rely on the underlying storage manager. And with HBase, we haven't implemented that yet. Again, with HBase, you have some throughput limitations, so it's probably not. Putting Impala and HBase together probably will not give you the performance that you get from HANA. So I think something else would need to um, evolve, a another storage manager that would give you much higher scan performance. But in theory, it is uh, completely possible to create a system that basically gives you HANA-style performance and functionality. Yeah, joining large data sets is very expensive in Impala. Um, is there any benefit to use a uh, view instead of a uh, typical SQL join, a SQL join? Um, so there is a, creates a hash table in the memory or anything else? Right, so the question was, uh, can you use a view instead of, in order to avoid a join in a part? And the answer is, well, a view is actually nothing, I mean, the view simply reflects. It's so it's just virtual and not really. Yeah, exactly. A view, a view in Impala is not materialized. So the view is just incorporated into the plan, and it's basically optimized the same way. It's as if you basically had written it verbatim into the, the plan. So no different. That's a logical library called Madlib, and it has been Um, so the question was, uh, there is a, a, a statistical analysis library called Madlib that is available, that was ported to Impala last year. And Madlib started out as a UC Berkeley project, I think, and it's also available for Postgres in single user mode, or uh, single node mode, obviously, and um, Greenplan as well, where you need a commercial Hawk. license. What? Hawk. And what? Hawk. Well, okay, Hawk, I mean, Hawk is uh, Greenplan, the Greenplan database. Oh, yeah, exactly. So, of course, there you require a commercial license for this. Um, and the answer is yes, the, the, we, we are continuing to work on that. In, partic uh, in fact, we just hired the person who did the port. Uh, his name is Victor Bithoff. He got his master's from Stanford, and he started in the Impala team uh, just a few weeks ago. And part of his work will be to um, basically give a little more polish to the Matlab port and make it a little more easily accessible. So you'll see more better integration and more usability. In Pala, uh, what I've seen is like uh, the queries which result in 10% of the data or the, uh, it better performs on 10% of the data. Uh, that is the table, if, if you want to query 10% of the data, it 
of concern. Is there any uh, plan in the future or the roadmap where uh, it performs a lower workload on the entire data set? Uh, I mean, Impala already runs on the entire data set, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure what you mean. performance is not as good as the high. That is, uh, I mean, Say if I can... Say, the entire data set, not just a query, just not performing on the data process. I'm not sure I'm following. So we did a performance comparison against Hive, and Hive is nowhere near Impala performance. It doesn't matter how much data you query. Uh, query in the sense, uh, we, we not just a web class, but on the entire data set, analytical workloads where we perform the group by class and all. Right. Uh, so the, and the applications, right. where we saw that um, in a continuum cluster, Hive was performing better than uh, uh, We've never seen that. There might have been something wrong with your setup. But, um, <laughs> I mean, I, like I said, I showed you this thing. If you uh, log in again, I can show you the, the same graph. Only the queries resulting in 10% of the data, no. the results of uh, overall results, the Impala is performing better. Yeah. Um, I'll happily show you this graph again. So, the, the bars on the right hand side is the deep analytics bucket, which runs TPCDS queries. A lot of these are seven way joins with aggregation. Uh, they run against the full data set, and this is what we measure. This is same hardware, both use cache data, etc. Right? We have not been able to replicate Hive running even close to the performance um, in, uh, when set up correctly. Right? I don't know exactly what you did, but like I said, uh, this is not something that we've been able to do, and we actually have people who know quite a bit about cluster setup. So, anyway. <coughs> about the scan performance. So you mentioned that um, the image based scan performance isn't optimal. Can you go into detail about that? Uh, yes. So the question was uh, I made some comments about scan performance in HBase. Can I elaborate? So HBase stores data in um, the equivalent of what's called SS tables and then at runtime has to basically reassemble it. So if you're doing a scan, it has to scan multiple of these and then kind of piece the data back together. And the way that it's done basically limits the amount of throughput you can get. So from HDFS, you're simply basically getting a block from disk or out of memory, you're copying it into your address space, and there you have it. And HBase has to do a lot of work. And so you end up often with a small single digit percentage of what the hardware is capable of. So we have measured from in-memory workloads, something on the order of a few hundred megabytes a second of throughput. And compared to what you get from your memory bus, which is, you know, like I said, 25 or 30 gigabytes a second, that is, that's very far from where you want to be. This is different from the SSD side. I mean, on a small bus, I was only two SSD drives. I've measured up to 100,000 HBase operations per second when part of the scanning table. So maybe the picture is different for SSD. Um, well, so HBase also gives you, the, so the, the comment was uh, maybe this changes with SSDs and so obviously HBase is a storage manager that gives you random access to the data. So you can do single row lookups and small range scans and of course, and updates, and of course that relies on, uh, relies on being able to do a lot of IOs and of course SSDs have orders of magnitudes more IO throughput not the raw transfer bandwidth, but the number of IOs they can perform is much, much higher. So I, I would say SSDs are probably ideal for HBase workloads. One more question about the scans. Um, is a scan always a full scan of the corresponding column? So if you look at full text databases, you have something like a skip word. Is there an equivalent of that? In um, so the question was, is there an equivalent to a, the skip operator that you find in text uh, retrieval systems, basically? And the answer is, I'm not quite sure that applies here. So normally when you um, scan a particular column of a table, you could, Impala doesn't do that right now, but if you, let's say you uh, scan data in Parquet and you had a predicate on the first column and then wanted to access the second column, you could there skip ahead. Uh, and Pata doesn't do that right now, but we're definitely planning on adding that in the future. It's a, it's a performance improvement, and um, yeah, it's worth doing.
we don't have any more any more questions. Uh, the question is, why did Cloudera choose to open source Impala? And the answer is, uh, we believe it makes the system more attractive for the general user population. Um, it is not proprietary. It is because it's open source. Anyone can download it. You can download the binary form and run it. You don't have to pay us licensing fees. And uh, we think it's a better system for that because we get more user involvement, we get better feedback, etc. So. Can you build a community for you? There is, right, there is, uh, Impala is developed in-house by Cloudera. We are working with some specific companies on targeted pieces that they want to add. So I can't give you the details yet, and we will announce that when it's available, basically. But there are some companies that would like to be able to scan particular file formats, and uh, so we're working with them on basically providing custom scanners for those file formats. Right. Uh, so the question is, how, to what extent are scans against HBase data parallelized? So Impala does parallelize um, across the regions. So Impala knows what regions a particular, let's say, scan range falls in, and then it breaks it up and determines what HBase region servers it should uh, run on and what Impala daemons are co-located with those region servers. What it doesn't do right now is then parallelize the scans on the, on the individual node. So that's something we're going to be working on. And on the disk. And on the disk. Well, disk is a little more difficult because that re would require you to try to map that, what you're trying to scan. And that depends very much on HBase. And since we don't want to second guess what HBase is doing, it wouldn't be, we couldn't paralyze it based on the disk assignment. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Impala has an explain command. Yes. Um, I have a question. As it as a byte as this map would use, does it uh, take into account the utilization of the data node? So the data node is busy with the skip and uh, go to the other data node? Um, the second question would be the other change with Yarn. Okay. So there were uh, two questions about um, basically scheduling. The first one was, does Impala take the utilization of a data node into account when it um, schedules to run a particular plan fragment on one node and not the other? And the answer is no. At the moment, it doesn't do that. It is desirable, but it's not happening at the moment. And then how does that change, that picture change with Yarn? And uh, when you run Impala with Yarn integration, it basically does a synchronous resource reservation uh, with Yarn. So each individual query then does synchronous resource requests against Yarn. And uh, there is a particular, um, I would say, an interface agent called Llama that translates between Impala requests and Yarn resource reservations. Because Impala, in Impala, uh, it is not necessarily known at runtime what the actual resource requirements are. Um, it's not like MapReduce that simply consumes its input and then does something and then writes the output. Right? Impala does a lot of stuff in memory. And so there needs to be some translation there. But so be that as it may. So this thing exists in order to make it possible to run in a yarn configured system. However, you have to realize right now it is uh, synchronous. So every time you run a query, there are, there's going to be a synchronous resource reservation against yarn, which can impact your <coughs> So the question is, are there any shortcomings of the approach that Impala takes compared to what a traditional data warehouse and relational database systems do? And the answer is uh, no, because this is in essence an ex extension of traditional parallel data warehousing or parallel database technology. So Impala does the parallelization and basically the query operators in a very similar way. Impala is extended in the sense that you can run on data that uh, lives in multiple file formats, so there's more flexibility there. 
and also when we uh, will finally support nested data types, you will also get a uh, much better integration with uh, newer serialization formats that you don't get from traditional systems. But the foundation is still the same. Oh, uh, so the question was, how does Cloudera make money? And the answer is, Cloudera sells uh, sub training and uh, support, and then also professional services. So uh, we actually do have a lot of customers, and a lot of those are basically traditional IT shops. And they will not simply download software from the internet and then run that and support that themselves. They actually they buy the support. And uh, so that's how Cloudera makes money. So in essence, that means that users who are not prepared to pay for it uh, don't end up paying for it. And they don't get support either. Obviously, you have to self-support. Uh, but you still end up using it and giving us valuable feedback and making the system better. So. All right. I thought they say 